Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening. And a very, very big welcome to all of you from all over the world to our first ever IZE webinar. Now, this is a really exciting time for all of us because we're having the opportunity today to talk to, right now, 172 educators from around the world. We've got Papua New Guinea, Malaysia, Singapore, Italy, UK, Argentina, Canada, the Soviet Union, Russia, we've got Perth, we've got, we have just literally got people from around the entire world joining us. And a very, very big thank you to each and every single one of you for, for finding the time to join us today. I'm going to start off with just some introductions. So I'm Judy Mann Lang and I work in Durban in South Africa for the South African Association for Marine Biological Research, which is based at Oshaka Marine World. And I'm currently the president-elect of the International Zoo Educators Association. Now, we're going to start off with just a quick introduction to what is the IZD. We are, not everyone might be familiar with the IZD, so we're a network of over 80 institutions representing zoos and aquariums and nature centers around the world. Our role is really to support people who work with people to inspire them to care for the environment. So we support educators around the world. We offer our members a wide range of services, ranging from our website, which is filled with support material. We have social media. We have an annual journal that we produce. We have a job exchange program. Uh, we do training workshops. And we also have a um, conference, which we run every two years. Now, speaking of which, our conference this year was going to be hosted by the magnificent San Diego Zoo. But unfortunately, as we all know, we're not going to be able to attend the conference. So what they've decided to do is to move the conference online, which means that so many of you can actually join us for the conference. And we're really looking forward to having as many of you join us as possible. So that'll be really exciting and that'll be in October. And if you follow our website and our social media, you'll find out more about that. Around the world, our places of work have been impacted hugely by the COVID-19 pandemic. At one stage, more than 95% of all WASA affiliated zoos and aquariums were closed. This is a situation that we never ever thought would happen. When we closed, the animal care staff kept on going to work because they were considered essential. As the educators, we suddenly were not essential anymore. And it's been a really difficult time for all of us. Some of us have been able to work from home and produce amazing online content. Some of us worked from home, trying to do as much as we could. Some of us have been furloughed, sent home with no salaries, but still employed. And some of us lost our jobs. So it's been a tough time for, for those in the zoo and aquarium education world. It's also been quite an exciting time because we've learned of amazing new ways that we can actually connect with our audiences. And for me, probably the most important lesson I've learned over this time is just how important educators are. We need live animals, they're brilliant, but we also need our live educators to share those animal stories. So while this has been a tough time for all of us, it's also been an amazing time. And that was something that led us to running this webinar because this is an opportunity for us to share our stories, for us to learn from each other and to really support each other. So without further ado, we're going to head into our panelists. But before we start, you know, we're educators, we like to have a few ground rules. So we'll just start with some ground rules. This is a webinar. So all of you are muted. We can't hear you and we can't see you. But you can please use the chat box to, to communicate with each other. And there is also the question and answer box. Kim, our amazing IT, is going to be helping us to monitor that just so that we can answer your questions. 
If you use the chat box, please remember just to be respectful as we do in all of our activities. And I think that that's about all of the ground rules before we, before we, start, we start going. Today, we've got five amazing people who are going to be sharing with us what, what they've learned over this time. But I have spoken a little bit about feelings, so I really just uh, forgot that we do have something where we're just going to ask you to share your current feelings. So you'll see that popped up on the screen is a poll. If you'll just choose whichever one of these you're feeling right now, and then at the end, we'll share the results. So please just spend two minutes and tell us how are you feeling right now? Okay, there we go. Okay, so these are our results. Well, some of us are feeling confused and worried, understandable. Just about everyone's looking forward to learning more, great. Some of us are tired, I think that's quite understandable, but also quite hopeful and supported. Right, thank you so much for those. And let's, let's head into our, our wonderful panelists. We've got right now almost 200 of you joining. So again, thank you so much for spending your time with us. And our wonderful team of panelists are all board members and they represent facilities around the world. And we've chosen people who can talk to us from the state of opening fully, not quite open, going to open a whole gamut so that we hopefully can share with you all of our experiences. So enough from me. Our first speaker for today is Antoinette Costa. She is from the Lisbon Zoo and she's going to be sharing some of her experiences from the European side of opening. So Antoinette, over to you. Thank you, Judy. So, and I'm pleased to, to be with, with all of you. <clears throat> so, uh, I'm Antonietta from Lisbon Zoo, and um, I'm also the ICT representative for Europe and Middle East. And we are facing really uh, very, very difficult times, and that we had to reinvent ourselves. So I'm uh, sharing my experience uh, in Lisbon Zoo. So we closed doors on the 16th of March uh, until three weeks ago. We, we just reopened three weeks ago. Uh, and during that time, we uh, launched a uh, series of online uh, activities. We started uh, with, um, we had to, to do it very fast, you know, so we had um, some workshops for adults, for, for students, uh, university students, uh, for one day, and then we adapted this, this, uh, uh, this environmental education workshops into eight hours um uh, they were eight hours uh, uh workshops into a 45 minutes zoom um, meetings with families you know and uh, teams related to nature conservation and we were uh, quite excited because uh, it was just in the beginning and we got around 3000 families uh, so we were quite excited with that so after that, uh, Easter camp uh, from uh, Easter camp, okay, we could not do it uh, face to face. So we just uh, decided to go on a new adventure and create online uh, activities on our conservation uh, activity blog. It was in, in our blog. We challenge, uh, we launched different activities to four age groups from three to five, from six to nine years old, from 10 to 12, and from 13 to 16 years old, because our camps are from three years old to 16 years old. So, and then we had more than 26,000 participants <laughs> and we were just amazing with the, this kind of results and uh, um, we launch every, every day we launch uh, activities for these uh, uh, ages so but we wanted to do more and to, uh, and wanted to do, uh, to know more about uh, how they were feeling and, uh, and how will they doing uh, the activities so we challenge uh, the participants to send us the results. Uh, all the activities carry out uh, in family, not just the participant, but in family. So, and with this strategy, 
we are able to measure the degree of satisfaction and participation also. So uh, the, female, the families had to send us videos doing and performing all, the, all activities. And it was so uh, uh, fun and to see all the families in their pyjamas doing all the activities and really was very, very good. And we had uh, more than 350,000 uh, families uh, that sent us the video doing all these activities. So in Easter, during two weeks, um they really uh, it was a very very good uh, activity and you you were we were very proud uh, of this so and we are keeping going uh, doing this and now we uh, for we reopen but uh, face to face uh, educational activities are suspended until at least uh, september so we are planning to to do it again maybe not every in an everyday basis but uh, with challenges for for example uh, we can challenge uh, participants for example in the in the beginning of the week uh, on mondays we give them a challenge for the whole week because now uh, people just start okay i, I speak for my country uh portugal and uh, uh, we are um we have cases uh, but not so so many and people want to go out in the nature so uh, our ch challenges will be more li like that not activities to do it at home but to do it in nature um with with families uh that's what we are uh, programming right now for our summer camps uh, our virtual summer camps during July and uh, in August. Um, it was uh, the, the this is a big challenge for us uh, because it is a big change of scenery uh, and working from home is even worse. We are still working from home now, uh, but uh, challenging participants, visitors, families, to do all the activities so i would like to to listen to you now and to um, what are your experience during this time with the virtual uh, camps Great, thank you so much, Antoinette, for giving us that perspective from, from Europe and just to hear a little bit more about your numbers and also about your interesting um, evaluation through getting videos from everyone. But we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Thank you so much. You. Coming up next, we're moving over to America and we have Deborah Erickson. She is our IZD president and she's going to be talking to us about their also their incredible online programming and a little bit about them reopening. So Deborah, welcome and over to you. Um, as many of you, we have been closed and it's hard for me to believe we hit the three month mark just a couple days ago. We feel very fortunate that on Friday, we finally got news from the governor's office in the state of California that we will be able to open on June 12th. And our plan as of uh, Friday is that uh, we will be open to the public on June 20th. Um, just as all of you, we, um, our community um, has been really challenged in many, many ways. Our schools in our area, in fact, the schools in the whole state of California have been closed this last three months. So what we did was we put a task force together internally to determine how are we going to, um, how is our educational community going to meet the needs? So I just wanna walk you quickly through three of the programs that we um, implemented. Um, just as we have done for IZE members, um, we, we looked at the teacher situation in the United States and it is amazing to me that even in this high tech days that 10% of US teachers feel um, uncomfortable, nice typo. Isn't this nice, you can fix it as you're speaking. Um, and it, 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 it's, it's, it's really hard to believe that. Um, so what is our solution? Um, we have this wonderful resource, San Diego Zoo Global Academy. 
And what we made a decision internally is to provide that service to high school and middle school children and teachers at no cost. And it was amazing to me with basically uh, no marketing that we've already had 13,000 students sign up for this program, 9,000 teachers, excuse me, 9,000 students, over 3,000 teachers. And I was overwhelmed when I saw the number of elementary school teachers that actually signed up because they needed resources too. And they've taken, they registered for a lot of courses, over 15, 50,000 courses, and as of last week, over 11,000 courses have been completed. The great thing about this is that this resource is also available for you. It's been great. We've had over, over uh, I believe, in the first few weeks, over 30 members um, signed up to also use the Academy's modules. Um, if you haven't done so, please sign up. If you're a member, you can also receive this benefit at no cost. We have um, three really great interpretation modules, over 25 modules on different species of animals, including elephants, giraffes, African penguins that you see here in this picture. Um, also, I'm sure that uh, many of you have children that are home. Um, it turned out that um, my, son's my son's teachers had never taught online before, never done a webinar. And um, at the beginning of the pandemic, the students in the U.S. were only receiving about an average of one to two hours of instruction a day. In fact, for some teachers, including the teachers at my school, it took them three weeks. So my son had no instruction for three weeks until they could determine how could they put their coursework online. Um, we have been fortunate um, over 25 years ago when we first got the pandas, we installed our first live cam. And as we've gotten each um, large new habitat coming online, we have installed another cam. When the pandemic started, we had 11 cams. We decided to add two more cams. And it's just amazing. Um, this increased our website traffic over 5,000%. Our most popular cams were at the San Diego Zoo, our polar cam and our uh, penguin cam. And uh, through our communications, um, what has been amazing to us is that um, Forbes magazine, a publication in the United States, um, listed the world's 15 best viral virtual tours to take. And, you know, number one was the Louvre. And I'm really proud to say number two was the San Diego Zoo. And then um, another popular, oh, there's the Academy, and another popular publication in the United States um, is Parade Magazine. And they listed their 45 best camps and San Diego Zoo was listed as number two. So what I would say is long-term investment in, uh, in things such as CAMs can be absolutely invaluable. And we've also been incorporating them into our learning programs. And then, um, as I had shared, my son, who even when his teacher started uh, instruction, uh, he was only he's only received one to two hours of instruction a day during this three months. We we discovered that um, um, elementary schools, even more than high schools, needed virtual science instruction. So our solution was to use our existing resources to create pr programming for them. So we created San Diego Zoo Kids Corner. It's um, what we did was we took our um, videos that we have created for our San Diego Zoo Kids program. I know that many of you are familiar with it because you've partnered with us and that is our TV channel for children's hospitals and Ronald McDonald houses. Over the last six years, we've developed, it's hard to believe, 50 hours of content for that channel. So what we decided is it was time for us to repurpose that um, 
create 25 minute segments that were interdisciplinary, including science, geography, medicine, uh, music, art, history, cooking. Uh, we have a character at San Diego Zoo called Dr. Zoolittle. We use him as host. And um, to date, we have posted four of these uh, learning adventures, and um, we have committed to creating uh, 16 in total. So that'll give you, that gives you some examples of some of the programs that we have created um, to help our community during the time of COVID. Thank you, Judy. That's great. Thank you so much, Deborah, for all of those wonderful resources that you've made available to, to our IZD members. The uh, Global Academy is incredible and those resources have been so useful. I know our team have been using it during this time. So that's a, a member benefit to, to have access to all of that material. So please, please make use of it. And thank you, Deborah, for that. Thank you, Judy. Right, we're now... We're now moving right over the ocean and we're moving to Australia where Leanne Wilson from Zoos Victoria is going to be sharing their online education programs and the experiences of visitors returning to the facilities both in Australia as well as in New Zealand. So Leanne, over to you. Thanks Judy. Um, I'd like to begin uh, first by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land on which I meet with you today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, I've popped up a timeline here because um, it's, it, it's something that I still marvel at um, in this sort of short space of time. Uh, 12 weeks ago, uh, our main online offering at Zoos Victoria was one fortnightly webinar. Uh, and when education teams shifted to working from home, um, it was the catalyst for the biggest um, and quickest pivot in online education program or in education programs that I've seen at my 17 years here at Zoos Victoria. Uh, in two weeks, we'd launched um, our Zoo Education Online and we started with our first program, which was the STEM Design Challenge. And that's where students um, were challenged to create design solutions for animals that were featured in our Animals at Home live streams. And so they create those um, design solutions using design thinking and upload um, a video to um, a website and educators at the zoo can provide feedback on their design solution. We then quickly built on that with um, Love Your Locals, which is based around our local Victorian threatened species, um, an English and science program that was linked to our Zoos Victoria podcast series. And that was an existing digital resource that we had. And then um, along with the, the existing student webinars, we created uh, seven virtual excursions, um, which were based around programs that we um, would run on site. And these were created to be run um, online with all the supporting resources that students and teachers would need to fully engage with um, those curriculum areas. And then lastly, uh, we created on-demand teacher PD. So that's teacher professional development that teachers can do in their own time. And we've seen a really great success um, with this in this short space of time. So I've popped up a few metrics um, from today. And we've had over 26,000 students register for our online programs, and they've registered for um, even ones that are coming up. So we've seen um, 7,663 students actually come through on the webinars. And they've come from um, schools here in Victoria, our home state, um, but also came from New South Wales, a neighbouring state, um, and as far flung as Japan and New Zealand and Singapore, which is fantastic to see. So what's this all meant for us? For us, um, Zoo Education Online has really allowed us to maintain a deep and active engagement with schools um, and students and teachers and build those strong relationships um, with schools that we hope will persist, persist um, beyond this time. And for educators, um, it, it's been really great because it's provided that meaningful um, work and that interaction with students um, that um, we as educators all value. And I had one educator reach out to me today, uh, which, because um, she knew that we, I was speaking about our online education programs at the webinar. And she shared with me that it, it's really, um, she's felt this experience has helped her maintain um, connections with each other through 
developing and delivering the online programs and their collaborative and teaching skills. And she really summed it up and said, you know, and it's really nice for this time, but it's helped them feel like they're still actually teaching. So what's coming next for us? Um, we're really fortunate that our gates are um, open to visitors, um, yet schools are still directed by our Department of Education not to visit. Um, so schools are still on the restricted list. So for us, the education online will remain in place and it can be scaled down um, when on-site programs return. And so with visitors coming through our gates um, and students are now back at school, um, the last of the students went back to at school learning today. Um, it presents sort of our next challenge for if we've got visitors coming through the gates on on-site programs, but education programs still delivering online, how we maintain that momentum and energy. Um, and, you know, we still know that there's such a need um, for schools for the online programs, particularly our rural and regional schools have reached out to let us know that this has been a great opportunity for them to be involved um, because distance and expense to travel to the zoos can be um, quite a challenge for them. Um, it, it's great seeing that the, the um, visitors come through the gates and we um, are we're still on catch numbers. And, um, but it's been great demand for um, basically all the online tickets um, getting, getting booked out. Um, but I did want to finish by saying I'm incredibly proud of the zoo education team here at Zoo Victoria and their resilience um, and maintaining their enthusiasm through this time. And I'm also proud of um, all the educators I see across the world. Um, so a big congratulations for your resilience through this time as well. And stay safe and um, do reach out if we can help you. Thanks very much, Leanne. And I think that what you mentioned is something that we might discuss a little bit later, is that this has given us new opportunities for outreach and perhaps will give us an opportunity to meet people and to reach them that we wouldn't, we wouldn't normally have found. So thank you for that. We're now going to whiz across the world back to America and we're going to welcome Becky Nellis. She is from Columbus Zoo and Aquarium and she's going to be sharing some of their experiences both during closure and now as they're starting to open. So Becky, over to you. Thanks, Judy. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm so excited to be here and have an opportunity to talk to all of you. Um, I did put together some quick slides that I wanted to share a little bit about um, our virtual camp programs. So like many of you, we've been closed since mid-March um, and we had to kind of think through what our department was going to do to be able to kind of tackle um, this time of COVID. So if we wanna go ahead and advance. Um, our traditional summer camps here at the zoo uh, served students anywhere from ages three up to 15. And we normally would host about 200 kids per week here at the zoo um, over a 10 week period. In March, when our zoo closed, uh, we, were, we were gearing up to have um, one of our biggest summers ever for summer camp. We were over 90% full already by March um, and anticipated the camp would have sold out that month. So when COVID hit, um, we initially kind of tried to think about, would we still be able to offer summer camp? You know, I think all of us were hopeful that we would get back to our zoos um, quicker than, than it has happened. Um, however, as time progressed, we realized that we needed to pivot and make a new plan. Um, so we decided to take the route of um, saying, you know what, we're not gonna do traditional summer camp. We're gonna go completely virtual. And when we made that decision, we contacted the people who had already registered and we gave them several options. We told them that they could choose between getting a full refund, um, they could transfer their registration from their, their existing zoo camp registration over to our virtual camps um, and re receive a refund for the difference in that cost, um, or they were able to donate their entire uh, camp fees. Uh, by, by taking that approach, rather than just completely canceling our summer camp, we were able to raise about $20,000 in donations. Um, and we were able to transfer quite a few people over to our virtual camp experience. Go ahead and move on to the next slide. All right, so when we started talking about these, these virtual camps, we wanted an opportunity to really try out what that could look like. We wanted to practice a little bit. So we created something called Virtual Adventures and we launched that uh, in April and started doing those programs twice a week for, um, for families to sign up. It was just a you know, individual at home, you could, you could sign up to participate in these programs. 
we tapped into a instructor who worked here at the zoo. She's been here at the zoo for uh, 15 years. She's extremely well known in our community and we used her as the face for this program. So Carrie started putting out um, videos saying, hey, I'm gonna be doing these sessions, come join me. I wanna be able to, um, to teach you right from your own home. So she connected for these programs from her house. Um, she used the Zoom webinar platform, just like what we're using today for this experience. Um, and the person who ran her tech was actually at his house being able to do that from behind the scenes. So they started offering these programs and we immediately had such a huge response that, um, that we started having to add additional sessions. So um, she was able to do about 400 uh, connections at a time. There would be multiple kids sometimes at those locations, um, but be able to really think about how could we make those programs interactive um, and still feel like she was right there with them. So she incorporated activities that included um, encouraging kids to, to maybe draw something and, sh and share um, their thoughts in the chat features um, and really was able to create kind of this, this wonderful online experience for students. Those programs last about 45 minutes. Um, and like I said, they gave us an opportunity to, to kind of try out what this, this new format was going to feel like for us. Go ahead and move on to the next slide. So the next step was we had to start preparing for camp. Um, unfortunately, our zoo was a location that suffered quite a few furloughs and layoffs. Uh, we had started this with a staff of 21 members. We had seven individuals who were laid off, so they completely lost their jobs. We had another seven who were furloughed. Um, two of those people work at our sister organization, The Wilds. So that left us with five people here at the Columbus Zoo to operate all of these programs. We quickly had to utilize our resources and figure out how we could bring back maybe a few, um, what we call seasonal employees, so like part-time employees who work hourly, um, to come back and just help with that instruction. So this is one of those seasonal employees that we brought back. We set up learning stations um, in any empty office space that we could find that had a decent backdrop. <laughs> so, um, so Eli here is actually sitting in one of our education offices um, presenting his program um, from right there um, next to our mailboxes. Um, and so we really had to kind of just be creative and think about how we could set this up um, quickly. Those individuals started three days before program started. So we um, very quickly put it into their hands all of their um, uh, components for their programs uh, and and had them start practicing. We pre-recorded over 100 video clips of animals here at the zoo. Uh, we put together different PowerPoint presentations as well as downloadable activities that parents could access um, to be able to use with their families at any time. So that was all part of the package was that parents could participate in that live session, but they also could do other pieces as well. Go ahead and advance with him. All right, so, so our Zoo Camp to You program um, is what we are calling our virtual summer camp. Um, that summer camp program has a live interaction each day for a week that's a two hour long um, interaction. We, we really kind of wanted to approach this with the idea that we didn't want kids to be sitting in front of a computer screen all day, every day. So what we said to parents was, we're gonna do this live interaction, we're also going to film it. So if you aren't available at that point in time, feel free to watch that video at a later time. Um, and they'll have access to that throughout the summer. They don't even necessarily have to do it right this week. Um, we gave them access to behind the scenes footage. So we went and we um, recorded interviews with zookeepers. Um, we asked them to record things of themselves because again, with, with um, COVID, we weren't necessarily able to do some of those interactions with them one-on-one. -on -one. So, um, so it's fun because you have these zookeepers who are kind of sending us non-produced um, pieces. It's really kind of them just talking to the students and giving them a real world look at the work they do every day. We, like I mentioned, included activities that families could use, but we really wanted them to focus on exploring the outdoors and getting outside um, rather than staying inside and using the computer screen. Um, and then we started off with 20 kids per session. We did end up overbooking some of them and taking up to 25. Um, part of that was that we realized that we didn't necessarily have all 20 students participating in every single session. So we realized that even if we said we were gonna allow 25, we usually didn't have quite 20 students um, participating. So that still allowed us to be able to be interactive um, and spend time with, with every student who was participating. Um, these programs, rather than being a webinar format, these are like a Zoom meeting where the kids are able to talk back and forth with us um, and really be able to share um, more of their own thoughts and, and experience. It's a little bit more personal than the webinar feel of the virtual adventures. So go ahead to the next slide. 
So what's next? Um, we are so excited because the Columbus Zoo is actually reopening this week. Um, we are tomorrow welcoming back uh, family and friends. We will open to members this weekend. And then on Monday, we will open to the general public. So we're preparing for all of that. Um, virtual camp will continue through the month of June. Um, most of those sessions are sold out. Um, and then we have virtual adventures, which was that original program that was the webinar program, um, which we're going to continue to offer all the way through July. And those programs are going to go not only to um, families now, but we also are marketing those to uh, our local daycare centers, um, people who would have come here on field trips to try to encourage them to use that resource with their, with their students since they're not able to leave their schools. And then starting in July, we're going to actually do in-person um, single day programs for students uh, ages six to 11. And that will be, um, like I said, it's just, it's one day where they'll come for seven hours. Um, it'll be groups of eight students with, with two counselors. Um, and we're going to try that out, being able to socially distance them and um, still allow them to come and visit the zoo in person. Go ahead, Kim. And if you're looking for additional information about um, any of these programs, you can access that at our website or um, absolutely feel free to email me and I'd be happy to um, answer any of your additional questions. All right, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Becky. And I think that what you've shown us is that even with massive staff reductions, you've been able to achieve an incredible amount. So it's been a tough time for the team, but you've been able to achieve a lot. And that's what us educators are good at, is uh, making the best of the situation. Thank you. Right, we are now moving back over the ocean and we're going to chat to Isabel Lee. She is from Ocean Park in Hong Kong and she's probably one of the places that's been the closed the longest. So Isabel, over to you. We look forward to hearing your comments. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Judy. Um, so um, Judy have given me two very difficult topics. One is talking about our extended closure and then a second one is how to keep the uh, staff motivated. So let me illustrate to you how extended the closure means to us in Hong Kong. So um, if everyone recall in 2003, we first have the SARS. And at that time, um, Hong Kong was like the epicenter. Um, it, it all blew up in Hong Kong. And from then on, even after SARS, a lot of us are very cautious on the next pandemic that may happen. So when the first COVID case happened, I think sort of confirmed in December 2019, we were all staying tuned like, OK, what's next? Is it going to come to Hong Kong very quickly? So I've uh, illustrated uh, up now on the screen for you all um, so that you get a feel of the cases or the momentum, the whole dynamics that is happening in Hong Kong. Um, the first case that happened in Hong Kong, of course, is an imported case and it happened in mid of January. And then local cases started to happen to, uh, on the second, uh, 22nd of January. So, um, and then uh, we see some local case here and there, and at most there's a burst in March that happened. And up until now, there's still one or two cases that happens every day. So here, as you can see, um, because that Hong Kong um, has started to have local cases, um, Ocean Park started to be closed on the 26th of January. That's the second day of the Chinese New Year. And that is the traditional biggest months for us um, throughout the year, because that's a day that we could get easily hit 40,000 visitors per day. So you can imagine uh, the heat uh, hit us quite hard. Uh, we were close for um, five months, almost five months. Um, and we're very happy to let you know that we'll be opening um, on this coming Saturday. So we finally see an end towards this whole uh, extended closure. And uh, at the same time, the park closes and the school closes pretty much at the same time. It's just because of the Chinese New Year that's happening towards the end of January. That's why you could see the official school closure is on the 3rd of February. And um, I would have to say, if the school is not reopening, I think it would be more difficult for us, Ocean Park, to announce our reopening. So these two timelines sort of correlates very strongly together. So there's, uh, among these six months, um, there are quite a few happenings. Um, as you can see, I've listed the park closure as a um, first row there. Um, and then uh, the team, along with a lot of you guys as well, uh, we have started to have home office and split teams. Um, there are two slots in there, as you can see, because uh, towards the end of March, we see some declining in the cases. 
but then it comes back up very quickly. So we had home office again uh, through almost uh, pretty much the whole of April. Um, like many of you, um, we have the uh, online communication um, with our community. It's a free YouTube channel that I could talk a bit more about it. So we launched that in mid of February and then it will extend on um, various uh, commitment and dedication that we think we've opened up pre, uh, a very really good platform. So um, it's really nice that we see our educators jumping in and say, oh, let's try to make this happen. So you see our really young, energetic educators being involved in the YouTube channel and becoming a YouTuber. Um, the fourth and the fifth point, as you can see here, is two quite challenging moments uh, for the whole staff team. Uh, we started compulsory no pay leave for staff in March and it still hasn't completed, it hasn't end. So um, towards um, June, now that we are trying to reopen, our staffing is really, really stretched because we do have an understanding that our finance is tight and therefore um, even our hiring of part-time or overtime is merely possible. So um, with a very tight staffing, we're trying to give the best for our visitors upcoming in June. Um, and I think for similar to many, many of you as well, uh, because uh, most of us rely on our gate admission, um, the finance for the company became really, really tight. And it was in May that we uh, submitted uh, official requests for the government to seek for, the gov uh, for funding support. And it was at that time, I'm not sure if which the news up to your, your local news station, but um, uh, if, if we don't get the funding, Ocean Park will be shut down um, in, by the end of June. So uh, it was a really intense three to four weeks, um, not only for the senior management staff who's trying frantically to engage with the community and re engage with the legislative members, to approve of the funding, but it's also hit the staff really, really bad because that's the moment that the whole social momentum could just turn around and say, let's just close down Ocean Park. So a few learnings that we had um, uh, in these difficult times. And again, I have to say that uh, I don't think I did a really good job in engaging the staff. I think we could always do more, but um, Alongside on the whole process, I think um, being transparent, timely, and with empathy is really important. As you can imagine that our staff is working um, a lot of hours, even at home, and they are on no pay. So suddenly you have like 20% to 30% of your salary being cut. So that is a really, really challenging time for all of us. Um, so communication, trying to use a lot of different ways, be it a big WhatsApp group with the whole, uh, whole group or other ways is really, really important to give them timely information. Another thing that we didn't use that much before is to use online co-creating software. So that is a bit more easier when each and every one of us are working at home that we could co-create on some of the projects. And when we are doing our conference call, we won't be just talking, 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 but we see something that's happening. Uh, some of them could type on something uh, on one slide before the next we talk about it. So, so those became very really important. Uh, and I have to link that with the reprioritization of the year plan under the new norm. So with COVID, I think throughout the world, we are all adjusting to the new norm. And under the new norm, our, our visitors have different expectations, have different needs, not only the functional needs, but also emotional needs. So we have to cater to the new norm very quickly so that we can engage with them with proper um, products. So uh, one of the thing is, of course, the uh, online, the YouTube channel that we created. Another one is to link it back to the park, which um, just two more slides I could illustrate to you a bit more. This is the online platform, the YouTube channel that we have created um, two weeks or around three weeks um, since the closure. And um, you could use the QR code to uh, reach out to the um, exact YouTube link directly. And that's the plan that we want to highlight the park's education message through five senses. And I think it's just an amazing way. Um, we don't have a lot of content that's available in the Cantonese dialect, the dialect that we use in Hong Kong. So it became a big hit because um, not only uh, does it receive very good response from the parents, but also the schools because of the school closure. They embrace on our YouTube channel and start to use our YouTube channel content as part of their, um, you know, learnings or homework that they assign to their students. So uh, that became a really good platform for us to give the engagement. 
but and this is a free platform as you can imagine it's a YouTube channel um, so what's important for us is to bring that online experience to an offline impact experience so we make use of this um, period of time when everyone was having home office earlier on to create another um, online uh, offline experience that's happening within the park so that we could drive more attendance later on that's our goal so uh, when we open it on Saturday we'll have a new um, journey that links back to our YouTube channel that highlights on using five senses to explore the world um, and it links back to some of our local wildlife and the nature play the experiential learning that we've been trying to embrace all along so this is a quick sum up of some of the things that have happened here and I'll pass the time back to Judy. Thanks very much, Isabel, for that lovely look at, at what you've been through. And I think that uh, your team has really taken strain since January. So you've had the most experience of all in handling this. Um, and I think that one of the questions that I'm going to ask you a bit later is how you've kept your staff motivated. So communication is one thing, but it's really keeping our staff motivated through this. I'm going to just have a, a few quick words about Africa because David, our Africa rep, is not able to join us. Um, we're all still closed. So all of our facilities in Africa are still closed. Um, and some, like Two Oceans, have managed to run some amazing online programs. But, but in Africa, most of us have problems with Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi is not something we take for granted. Uh, some of us even have problems with electricity, which is not that reliable. And this has been quite an interesting time for us with everything going online. And I think that what we've learned is firstly, we need to create a lot of material beforehand. So we need to start being prepared to do online education much, much better. What we've done a lot of is create material that can be easily downloaded and used at home so that it doesn't need continual Wi-Fi. So people can turn on, download when data is cheap and then carry on using it when, when data gets more expensive again during the day. So we've been working on, on different ways of using technology where for us, Wi-Fi is expensive, electricity is unreliable. So I'm in awe of some of this amazing online experiences that everyone's done. We've gone a slightly different route because we've tried to, to really cater to people who maybe don't have those resources. But we've learned that we are going to need to, and I think many of us have learned this, we need to really have a lot of stock um, ready for, for online content and to be able to let people download, et cetera, as, as we need it. So that's just a very quick, a very quick summary from, from us from an, an African perspective and what we've been doing in Africa. I think that we now have uh, time, just a few more minutes. Yeah, we've probably got about nine minutes just for a few questions. And I know that there are a few questions in, in the question and answer box session, but, but one that I would like to put to our panelists and just especially for people who've had to lay off staff, people who've had to furlough staff, just a few words about keeping the education team motivated. Just maybe one thought from each of you about how you've kept your team motivated over this time. So here in Columbus, um, it, it has been challenging, I'm not going to lie, <laughs> um, just because we lost so much of our, our team. However, um, we have worked really hard to stay in touch, similar to what other people have mentioned. We um, check in with each other regularly. I think that's extremely important. So we've had, um, where normally we would have a, a once a week, you know, staff meeting. During this time, we've been meeting multiple times per week um, over Zoom so that we can see one another, as well as maintaining um, a chat through, um, through our phones and kind of keeping each other updated on what we're doing. Um, we've also tried to, um, you know, keep, keep things lighthearted. So I think throughout that communication, we've tried to find ways to send kind of uplifting messages. Um, we went and delivered um, little plants to everybody at their house and left them on their doorstep and said, hey, you know, go outside, we left something for you. So we just have tried to do some things like that to let people know, even our furloughed staff, um, that we're thinking about them and that we're here to support them as well. Thanks, Becky. Anyone else want to share just a little bit about keeping keeping your teams motivated? Um, Judy, we have daily Zoom meetings. It's been really hard to be disconnected with one another and just by seeing each other half an hour a day and talking about the challenges we have both, and it's not just um, professionally, but personally, 
it's been very, very uplifting. And then um, every other Friday, we have online happy hour at the end of the day. And that really has raised people's spirits dramatically. And um, I make sure that I go around and I, um, and I ask everybody, what, do you, what are you thankful for? And the, the um, answers are just surprising and heartwarming. And in fact, I feel like I know a lot more of my colleagues better now than I ever have before because of the happy hours. I think that that's an important point, Deborah, and something that's come through from many of the, the webinars that I've participated in is the importance of actually looking after ourselves. So as educators, we're really used to giving because our nature is to give. We, we give every time we present, every time we work with people, but sometimes we actually need to look after ourselves so that we can keep giving. And during this time, I think it's really, really important that self-care is, is so important because we can easily run dry, especially when we're not getting our soul food. And for us, our soul food is often working with people or being out in nature. And without that soul food, it's sometimes difficult to, to keep digging deep. So looking after ourselves, I think, is something that we need to just be, be kind to ourselves. So I think that that's an important point. Anyone else got any ideas about motivating? To those ones, Judy, um, but we also look for ways that we can actually celebrate any milestones or celebrate successes. And so, yeah, we, we can do that through connecting online and um, yeah, just having a bit of fun still together. So even if we're connecting online, um, we bring that fun to, to everything that we're doing. Great. Thank, thanks, Leanne. One of the questions that I saw that popped up in the chat group that I think is quite important is how do you make sure that people know about all these incredible online programs that you've been running? So what are your, if you had to choose one channel that's really, really worked to communicate your online programs, what would those channels be? And maybe we'll, we'll start off with Isabel and then we'll work our way around. Um, for our YouTube channel, we work closely with the marketing team for the um, Facebook ads. So we do purchase quite a few ads there. But uh, what I have to say, as if I have to choose one thing, is our collaboration with the school community. Because uh, we really reach out to the teachers, to the principals, and have them have the comments and hear them, understand them what their needs, and having them talk to the students to bring it to the students uh, while their mouth, it's much more beneficial than having us have many, many ads. So having that word of mouth from the principal and teachers are very important. Great, thanks, thanks, Isabel. Um, Becky. Uh, so we, I would say our most successful uh, was sending out emails directly to our members. Um, we know that they are our biggest supporters. And so when we started offering those opportunities, we, we let them know and gave them the first chance to be able to sign up for things. And that, and that worked really well for us. Thanks, thanks for that, Becky. Um, Leanne? Yeah, similar. We have um, emails of to our teacher members. So we've got um, just under 4,000 um, teachers who are members for Zoos Victoria, as well as um, a Teacher Tribe Facebook group. So that's where we can promote um, through that closed group as well. Um, and social media. So going out, even just going out on Zoos Victoria's social media has been really effective. Okay, Thank, thanks, Leanne. Deborah, from, from your side? Yeah, I, I would agree that email and social media have been really great as far as our general programs. I think one of the key things we did was we created one web page and we put all of our resources available. Um, and then we used a campaign name, We're Here Together. So we use that everywhere in the emails and all of our communications. And um, really, your you, this wonderful community that's online with the academy um, we reached out to quite a few of our um, zoo partners and academy participants and we said please share this link with your teachers and that's how we i i i want to thank everybody um, so many of you shared it it's great that um, we have teachers and students from around all 50 states and from many countries in the chat box, I put the Academy link in there. Please share that with your teachers and your students. We've um, extended um, free use of these modules through the summer, through August 31st, so. 
That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Deborah, for that. I think that we're starting to, to run out of time. We've got one, one minute left. I know we still have some questions and we still want to do a poll at the end, but I think that um, this has been a really hopefully worthwhile opportunity for, for us to share ideas and, and maybe just let's see how you're feeling now. So maybe we could just quickly do the poll and just, yeah, let's, let's see how everyone's, everyone's feeling right now. While we're doing that poll, I'm just going to, to let everyone know that we are possibly going to look at doing more of these sort of webinars. Um, we might have particular topics that we'll choose, but hopefully this is just the start of, of us being able to connect to all of our members more regularly, uh, in addition to our conference in October, when we're all be able to get to know each other a, a lot better, hopefully. Okay, I think everyone's had a chance to uh, select. Okay, that's great. We're feeling inspired. Mission accomplished, team. <laughs> this has been inspiring for all of us. And I think that it's been a, a chance to learn and a chance to share. And a very big thank you to Kim from St. Louis. Thank you so much for all of your, all of your help and support. Okay, so she's put in a question. Thanks, Kim. Would you be interested in participating in more IZD webinars? If we could have your answer to that. And how often would you like to see these offered? And then just a question that we'd like to find out is if you're an IZD member or not. So if you could please go through these very quickly. And just so that everyone knows we have recorded this session. So it will be available on our website and via our social media so that if anyone wants to share it, we can share it with, you can share it with anybody you'd like to. Okay, well, that's a very good start. 100% would like more IZD, maybe once a month, once a quarter, once a month is a good one. And we have a number of our members, but we also might have some new members joining us. So that's wonderful. Thank you so much. So just to close, thank you, Kim, for all the technical work. Thank you so much to, to our fellow IZD board members. Thank you for your time and for preparing and, and for talking to us. And then a very, very big thank you to each of you. This whole COVID time has really taught us just how important being connected to nature is and how important nature is to every single one of us. Let's, let's use this time as something that we can grow from and learn from and emerge as, as even better educators, as, as we fulfill probably one of the most important roles in any of our facilities, and that's connecting people to our animals. So from all of us, thank you so much and good luck. Hopefully we'll all soon be open soon and see you at the next webinar. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye.